Uh, ready, set, sing is not a recruiting drive. We all uh, uh, like the idea of getting new members, but basically it is an offering to the community of free singing lessons. And as Marty Munson, our CEO, has stated in his mission, we sing, we serve, no strings attached. Realistically, uh, after six weeks of training, a number of the guys will say, gee, can I join? And that's really what you're aiming for. You'll hear it when they're talking. You don't want to be, you don't want to let your members lean on these guys and say, hey, you want to join? Hey, you want to join? And all that sort of stuff. We make it such that all you're doing is welcoming them to free singing lessons. And you're aiming for them to get to the end of the six weeks and say, would it be okay if I can't come next week? I'd like to join. You know, and that has worked very successfully. <clears throat> and in reverse, when guys have gotten on their case right away in the first week, hey, you know, you may want to join, what's happening is they disappear. Okay? So trust those words. Um, in the past, a number of chapters uh, in BHS and Sweet Outlines have run different ready set things. This one is different. Nate and Mike spent a lot of time analyzing what was done, found a lot of things that were not being done right, so they changed it. And uh, this one's successful. And to talk about the successfulness, at this point, and I try to get all chapters when they do a Ready, Set, Sing to let us know the results of your program. At this point, we have exposed barbershopping to 210 different men uh, throughout the district. And 83 of them said, hey, I'd like to join and have joined. Okay? And that's a pretty good percentage, 83 out of 210. I'd like to introduce Nate Barrett and Mike Yodice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Nate is going to be teaching the uh, directors of the musical part of it. Mike is the guy to get the people in the door in the first place. Without getting the people in the door, he's a waste of time. Uh, so it's very, very important, seriously, to get the people in the door. Uh, some chapters have not listened to Mike, and they ended up getting one guy in the door. Other chapters did exactly what Mike said and got 26 guests in the door. So I encourage you to uh, believe. Yeah. Do you have anything to say before you start? Please, I was like say going in. Um, the format of the course, like Oli said, is we take the directors slash musical leadership and we go in one room and the marketing guys go in another. Uh, obviously when we're split off, Mike and I are going to talk about our respective topics, but we'll also talk about other things and culture and some of the other things that are kind of a little bit deeper than the surface on that. Uh, after we have our own separate sessions, we come back and we uh, have a joint session where we kind of talk about culture and operations and some things that kind of go a little deeper and uh, talk about sustained success of the program. Uh, only other notes I have to say is we've done this, like I said, this is I think our eighth time counting, you know, Harmony College East, District Convention, uh, Division Conventions, all that stuff. Uh, when we talk to chapters afterwards, uh, biggest things they usually say is we wish we were more open-minded and listen to you all the way. Because if this is something where if you do it halfway, or if you say, oh, well, you know, we're only going to kind of, you know, listen to half of what you're saying because that doesn't really fit what we're doing. Uh, I just want to say, if you are that set on what you're doing and you think it's that good, then you could leave now. Uh, no, I'm joking. But uh, just please be open and feel free to ask questions and push back on Mike and I. And if there's something you disagree with, uh, we've probably already had that fight with someone. And uh, we'll be happy to have it again. Any questions? Cool. So as we're getting settled, so um, we got a basic introduction to all our fellow directors here. Uh, we got everyone out so we can speak freely. Uh, so, how many people have been directing their chapter for less than a year? This chapter? Yes, that chapter. Okay, you've been directing for less than a year, directing for less than a year. Uh, how many people have been directing their chapter for less, uh, let's do one to three years? Okay. 
Okay, how many people have been directing their chapter for three to five years? How about over five years? Okay, what do we got? Well, three, this, chap this chapter six. Okay. I've been directing for 15. Okay. Seven and a half. Seven and a half years, wow. So we've got a, a nice variant. So the less than a year, how, how short? Four weeks. Four weeks? Yay, I mean. <laughs> we've all been there. So don't ask me to come up front. <laughs> and she hasn't left yet. You believe that? Four weeks in. Uh, no, that, that's great. Yeah, I, I just think it's very interesting when we come to these things to see how varied um, the experience is. And I think another thing I want to point out, too, is the difference between lowest amount of members and highest. I think we had, um, how many of you guys have in Brandywine? Uh, active 19. 19, and then I think our highest was what, 35? Someone said that? Yeah, we're 35 to 36. 35, so that's, that's a pretty decent range. That's pretty representative of what we're usually dealing with in the BHS. Um, I, I guess to kick it off, well, you know, it, it makes the most sense for me to tell you our story and what, you know, Morris Music Band, how that's been going. Uh, I'm going on, I guess in a few months, it'll be four years I've been directing the Morris Music Men. Uh, when I started, it was because I was going to school locally and I had sung with them a few times before and their director had walked out of rehearsal because he, he got PO'd and just decided to. And uh, so I got a text from Dave, the guy who's filming the other one, who's our current chapter president. And he said, uh, hey Nick, can you come by and you know, direct us for a little bit because we didn't have a director. Um, so I was their intern for a little while, also known as Sucker. And, um, so I was the interim director for a little while, and uh, I got sucked into that, and you know, I became the, the full director. Uh, I'm just going to tell you our story so you understand where we came from and how you know, things can be different for you and how you know, there, there's always a light at the end of the tunnel. So when I started with the Boards of Morris Music Man, we had nine active members. Uh, we were about a little over a thousand dollars in the hole for money, um, and uh, I'd say the performance quality was somewhere around terrible to awful. Um, the, the repertoire was—I um, I don't think there was a song that talked about electricity you know, in there. It was, it was all super old, uh, super old barbershop songs, just nothing even close to modern. And uh, the guys just absolutely hated it. I'll be honest with you, it was a chapter where I walked in and nobody you know, had any fun. It was a director that drove him into the ground because he just wanted to win contest. That was his goal. They spent six months a year on two songs. Um, he would bring in, he spent thousands and thousands of dollars a year on coaching. Um, you know, flying coaches from Chicago and everywhere else for a 20-something guy chapter just to get him to win. You know, that was the big goal, get him to win and get him to districts and it drove the chapter into the ground. Uh, so when I came in, uh, I, we were broke, nine guys, uh, no one liked it. So my first job was, okay, we, we gotta make this fun again. And we're gonna talk a little bit about this when we get to the culture and the joint session. My whole goal when I looked at it is I said, okay, they're not gonna learn how to sing well in a week or a month or a year. Um, they're not going to be able to do much. We, we can't afford to do much in terms of coaching. We can't afford to do anything. All I knew I could do was just try and make it fun and enjoyable. And, you know, I start off that way because I think as directors, we get so focused on these little goals. And I say little because they are little goals. Because at the end of the day, the directors that have been here seven and a half years, five years, ten years, however long they've been directing, they'll tell you when you, they look back at what happened, it's never, oh, I remember this time when our singing score went up two points or this. It's, it's going to be about the memories you had along the way. And when you think, and you guys, it's, we tend to focus on, okay, these little improvements, this, that, the other thing. But when you think about what actually makes a difference in your guys' lives, that's not it, right? And I think the BHS, this is something I've commented on, I've said it to board members with us, we're getting awfully focused on little things, and we're not actually focusing on these big things. So what I'm talking to you guys, I'm not going to talk to you as directors or music VPs uh, alone. What I really want to talk to you as is the musical leaders of your chapter. Because you guys are the leaders of your chapter. I know some people say, oh, no, 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 my board is the leadership. No, no, your board isn't the leadership. Your board is the management. Okay, there's a difference between management and leadership. Management is making sure all the trains are running on time. Making sure everything's going well. Making sure, oh, okay, this, we've got people showing up for the sing-out. We've got, okay, I've got all that taken care of. You're the leadership. You're the leader. You're the figurehead. You're supposed to be in charge of the vision. You're supposed to be in charge of where your chapter is going. 
how good you could be. You're supposed to be in charge of the culture, getting the guys excited about what's going on, making them happy. That's, that's your goal, okay? And if you get confused and think your job is to manage or musically manage your chapter, there's no amount of guys that we can help you get through the door that are going to stay and help your chapter survive. And I, I, I'm saying this, I know it's blunt, but if we focus on this whole, okay, well, we've got to just get better and we've got to make sure we're, you know, we're going up a point every year at contests and the same two songs, and you know, if that's your focus, you're completely shot. And this course will be useless. And I know that's blunt, but that's what's happening with so many chapters right now. And then they keep showing up every week and they look around and say, oh, Tom, Larry, good to see you, Tom, Larry, good to see you. And then guess what? Then one day they look to the left, Tom's not there because it's been the same Tom for 30 years and then they never put someone in his chair. So when we talk about what our job is, we can look on the micro level and say, okay, I want my chapter to do better. Right? I want my chapter to grow, I want my chapter to thrive. And that's your job as the leader of your chapter. Don't lay it on the board, don't lay it on anybody else because you're the only person that owns the floor every night in front of your chapter, in front of your course. Your guys come and it's gonna be for you and the experience you create for them. The second part of why this is important, and why I'm kicking it off like this, talking about the musical leadership, is that you, when we did what we did with Morris Music Man, and you know, I talked to Oli about it, and when we started traveling around the district doing this, it's because we think it's our job to help the Barbershop Harmony Society too. And I don't know about you, but the, the person that brought me into the society, I, I call him a couple times a year just to say thank you. I was at a street fair, Guy came up to me, you know, broke my arm to come to a chapter on a Tuesday night. And I call him at least a couple times a year, Al. He st still sings with the Ocean Airs. I call him up and say, Al, I just want to say thank you for, you know, busting my arm and my balls and getting me to, to show up on a Tuesday night. And be, I just feel so thankful for what Barbershop's given to me. And, and the music is great, but we obviously know the best people you're ever going to see are barbershops. The best friendships, the kindest people, the funnest people, the guys that, you know, if it's the middle of the night and you need someone to call, you know, it's a barbershopper if you have to choose, right? We're, it's just the best group of people you can ever meet. So I think we kind of owe it as chapters in Northern Division or Central Division or the Mid Atlantic to make sure that this perpetuates beyond us, right? Because there were so many people that got what we're doing started. I mean, these aren't new chapters we're talking about. Right? These are chapters that have been going for quite a while. I don't know about charters, but I don't know. I know at least a bunch of these chapters are probably 40, 50 year chapters, right? Harris, right? You know, you guys, 48, 48, 48, I mean, 49. and think about all the people, and, and I kind of think about it as musical leadership. Think about all the people that came before us in these chapters that before we even thought about barbershop or before we were a twinkle in a parent's eye for some of us the people that perpetuated these chapters and kept them going so we could have the awesome experiences and friendships that we've had, we kind of owe it to them, right? I know that's, that's kind of a, a different statement, but it's true. So, as the musical leadership of the chapter, um, I, I really want to say, if there's one thing you have to focus on throughout this program and beyond, it's making it fun and enjoyable for your guys. Um, I'm giving this as the general overnotes, and we're going to talk about culture later, like I said, but this is something that I really need to hit home for you, because if we don't get this paradigm shift as directors to where we are actually with the, the BHS versus where we were 50 years ago, it, it's never going to happen. If you think your guys are going to show up every week just to sing the same songs, you're going to be able to attract younger people, and you're going to be able to attract middle-aged people, and they're going to come just because they want to sing two songs and just grind vowels for two and a half hours, unless you're a competition chorus, it's useless. What we need to understand is that it's our job to enrich the lives of our members in the realest way possible. Um, when I think about a Tuesday night, it's not just about, okay, how can we get it better? How can we do this? You have to be something special to your guys. When I made it my focus to make it fun and make it better for them, I literally would ask myself every Tuesday, how could I make Tuesday night the best guy the best night of these guys week. How could I have them say, Tuesday night is the night every week that I look forward to, that I cannot wait to get back there. I didn't make it about how good you know the, the chords were, about anything like that. How can I make it the best night of their week? How can I make it the most enriching night of their week? How could I have them walk out and say, thank God that I have my Tuesday nights because 
when I can step away from work, when I can step away from the craziness of this. And if that's your goal, is to enrich their lives, how's that going to change with you do? Because if you're in a chapter and you know the number keeps shrinking and you have people come in the door and they say, uh, you know, it's okay, but it's kind of just a bunch of guys, you know, whatever. If that's the reaction, you got to realize you have to do something different. If you think that it's going to be singing better, that's the only key, you're wrong. And, and I really want us to look at this program, and this is the, you know, the perfect segue to the program, because like Oli said, it's, it's no strings attached, right? You know, I'll tell some stories later about some of the people that came through the program, never joined the chapter, and just having them with us was a life-changing experience for me. And some of the guys that have joined, uh, I, I can't even tell you some of the, the moments that have happened and some of the life-changing things that have happened to them and to us that made a difference just because we exposed them to this. Just because we were able to bring music into their lives. So when you think about this program, I don't want you to say, okay, I, okay, I know he's saying it's not a recruiting drive, but we really just want to make it a recruiting drive and, and, and you kind of have that mindset. I really want you to walk into this and say, I'm the musical leader of my chapter. It's my job to make these people's lives better. They trust me with two and a half, three hours every single week. They're giving me that as a gift. What am I doing with that gift every week? Am I wasting it? Am I pouring it down the drain? Am I doing something for my own ego? Not that directors have egos, but am I doing something for my own ego? Or am I doing something for them? Am I making the tough call? Because I see it as being the best for them in the long run. The best for the BHS, the best for the Mid Atlantic in the long run, however you want to look at it. That's how it all starts. So, um, I don't know how much, how many questions we could have at that point, but to kind of segue more into how the program works, um, put it back in the context of our story. So, I was, we, our chapter was completely broke. We were literally in debt in the hole. We had to borrow money from members ahead of shows and get them to backfill the whole, and we would pay off the members as we would go. That's how broke we were. We had outstanding debts just to get through to the point where we could have a show. Um, so I said to myself, we need to find a way to get guys in the door. So you talk to a couple of people and they say, have a guest night. So I walked into a meeting and I said, all right guys, we're gonna have a guest night. And uh, I don't know how many of you guys know Dick Florsheimer, I love the guy, he's been around for about a thousand years. And uh, I said, so we're gonna have a guest night. So I want everybody to bring two friends that aren't in the chapter right now. The guy raised his hand and he said, Nate, if you want me to bring two friends that are not a member of the chapter, I'm gonna need a shovel. And meaning everyone else was dead because his only friends were all here. And I just looked up and I was like, wow. He said, look at us. He goes, we're all in our 70s, 80s. He said, we come here every week. He said, how many friends do you think we have that aren't actually a member of this chapter? Which should say two things to you. A, when we sit here and say, okay, it has to be through our members network, chances are if your members are in the chapter a long time and they love it, they've tried to already bring all their friends, right? So that's kind of a BS approach. It is. Um, the second thing is, realize how important it is to their lives, and that was kind of a reminder when I'm sitting here saying, oh man, this course might go down the drain, I just had a guy say, this is where all of his friends are. What does that mean to you? Talks about the significance of this in the guy's life. So I said, okay, so we can't do a guest night, can't do a buddy night, can't do anything like that. So I looked at some things. I said, well, why don't we do some advertising? We're broke. Okay, we can't really do any advertising right now. Uh, I, so I looked into the website and I said, okay, what's going on with this ready, set, same thing? And I looked at it and I printed out the packet from the society, which is beautiful and glossy photographs and, you know, talks about what Sound of the Rockies did with their, I think it was like a $5,000 marketing budget or something like that, if you if you print it out. And I'm not joking, if you go to the website, you print out the one that talks about how Sounds of Rockies did it, great, they're an amazing chorus, love them as an organization, God bless them that they can afford thousands and thousands of dollars in marketing, but like I said, I mean, we, we couldn't afford, you know, iced tea after rehearsal, so at this point for me to say, okay, we need thousands of dollars in marketing. So I looked at this and I said, wow, this is super expensive. I looked at how they did the course, I was like, Okay, kind of interesting, not exactly what I would do. Site so had another packet that was done by some committee. Um, I read through that one, interesting points. And I really honestly asked myself, okay, this race and sing program that they have is supposed to have worked, it's supposed to be good. What do I honestly think about this if I look through the eyes of somebody who isn't a barber shopper and came in? And that's what really, when I want to talk about it, a mindset you have to have, don't think about yourself as the 30 year barber shopper that you know just loves everything and boy if I get a dominant seventh I'm gonna you know ring the crap out of that. We have to think about people that have no exposure. 
right? We, we have to get rid of this incestual view of, oh, a bar, well, I love this. Yeah, of course you love it because you'll stay up till 2.30 in the morning singing tags in the staircase because you love it so much. But what if you've never been exposed to it? Is that, so you mean to tell me that someone's going to come in and, oh boy, street, Sweet Rose in the morning, I was listening to that on the radio today. You know, they're, they're not going to say that. <laughs> you got to think about how you connect them to what they are. And you got to think about rapport. And, you know, the definition of rapport that I always loved is it's getting on the same level of someone so you can connect and then you can go somewhere from there, right? So if you don't meet people at their level and you say, oh, here I am on my level, I'm, I'm a barber shopper, oh, you're down here? Oh, what, you don't like these songs? What's wrong with you? Okay, oh, no, oh you, you young kids, blah, blah. It turns into this, you guys are never going to get on the same level, aka they're never going to want to be a part of you. So I had to say to myself, let's take our barbershop goggles off. It's pretty scary. And, you know, what are we going to do that's going to be appealing to everyone? So Mike and I sat down and completely redid the program. And uh, Mike will be talking to you guys about how we redid the marketing end of it to make it completely free. So, and I'm telling you guys this so you know, if your guys come back and say, hey, we need a $1,000 marketing budget, you know, tell them to take a walk because Mike's teach them how to do it for free. Um, and I said to myself, how are we actually going to teach craft in a meaningful way that's going to appeal to newer people, that's going to appeal to people that are brand new? And we're going to go through that. Um, but if you look at the way our society's literature is, and I'm just telling you this because I think it's informational and you need to hear it. If you look at the way we teach craft, like if you get that, what's that, the old yellow book, the, you know, the craft book. Okay, section one is posture. Section two is breathing. Section three, vowels. And, and then you keep going through, right? So when we would look at how these people were teaching craft, it'd be week one is posture, which makes a lot of sense in barbershop because we have singing judges that come in and tell us the same thing every year and say, well, you guys weren't standing straight, so... That's why you, you lost. Oh, okay, okay, great, great. So we know posture is important, right? And then they talk about breathing the second most, so then we know that's important. And what you look at, though, is I said to myself, is this really a real way to teach these guys craft? Okay, so picture this. You're a guy that's never sung before. You see a poster for free singing lessons. You tell your wife, you know what, I'm going to go. I'm going to go try this whole free singing lesson thing. I've always wanted to sing. You go off. You give up your Tuesday night. You know, you have to tape Murder, She Wrote instead, or whatever you have to do. Um, you know, you have to run up the TiVo, and you take this Tuesday night, and you show up to, to someone's uh, chapter. And the guy, you say, I really want to learn how to sing, Nate. I'm, I'm ready to go. And you stand there, and I say, oh, okay, great, man. All right, so you, you, have you ever sung before? No, I've never sung before. Okay, cool, 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 no problem. So what do I do? All right, let's, let's get you to stand straight. Okay, we got you. We lined up your show. We got everything great. Okay, now sing. Uh, 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 okay, great. So then that's the first week, and that goes like over like a lead balloon, right? So the guy comes home, he tells his wife, and she said, Hey, honey, how'd the singing go? He goes, Great, watch. Uh, twinkle, twinkle, little star. Okay, great. But you know what? That's just the first week. That's, that's got to be the exception, right? So the guy comes back the second week, okay? And the, he goes, Oh, you know, uh, how'd the singing go? I said, I don't know. I, I think I'm coming along. I think I'm coming along. Okay, great. So uh, what am I going to learn this week? We're going to teach you how to breathe. Okay, great. So the guy comes in. Okay, straight. Okay, I'm going to see how straight. Okay, now I'm going to teach you how to breathe. Uh, 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 uh. So he comes home, demonstrates for his wife. How, how's singing go, honey? Okay, now I, I learned how to stand straight. Now I learned how to breathe. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. Oh, boy, how's it sound? Still sounds like shit. Okay, good, consistent. All right, go back for a third week. All right, what about vowels, right? And, you know, it keeps going on and on. But if we teach this the way that we've constantly learned craft throughout this society, it sucks. We're supposed to appeal to people that have never sung before, okay? And this goes to the whole when people talk about, oh, we want to get the chapter growing. Oh, well, why don't we get Joe and Bob and all these guys who left before? They're going to come back. First of all, those people who left before, they left for a reason. Okay, so stop with this, This oh, one day all these guys who left are going to come back. You know how many men there are? If, if I just draw a five-mile circle around where your chapter meets, I guarantee there's hundreds and hundreds of men. If you mean to tell me, if I draw a 15-mile circle, thousands, okay? Every time, guaranteed. Unless you're in, like, the, the East Bumble chapter, you're okay. So for us to say, oh, well, we've, you know, we can't get new men. There's men everywhere. And when you think about how much fun we have, if you're having fun, are there men that would love to have fun consistently with the greatest group, group, group of guys they could ever know uh, on a weekly basis? 
Is there a group of guys that would love, are there guys out there that would love to change people's lives by performing all the time? Probably. Do they know how to sing? Probably not. But if we sit there and we treat them like, oh, well, this is the way you're supposed to learn craft. When they come in the door, this is how you, you stand, you breathe. Is that really going to make them appeal? Is that going to appeal to them? Is that going to make them say, boy, this is something I want to be a part of? Absolutely not. So we completely redid the craft end of it. Um, so we redid the craft. We redid the marketing. We'll go through that. And then kind of the third thing I want to talk about as musical leadership is we said we need to redo the culture. And we're going to talk more about this later, but some of the, the things that I, I want to prepare you for now is you're going to have to make some real changes to the way you run things, to the way your guys handle things, to the way that you handle music, if you want to have a sustained chapter. So I said to myself, I said, okay, well, let's get a song that these guys are going to love to sing. If we're going to do this program, and some of the guys go, well, why don't we just do a polka? Just do a polka, we already know it stuff like that, you're going to have to fight back on the repertoire end. We'll talk about that. I had to fight back on the repertoire end. I had to fight back on the end where you had guys coming in that actually worked. Okay? We started having these guys. Our meeting started at 7.30 promptly. Then we would have guys that couldn't come in until 7.45. You know why? Because they just got off the train from the city. They stopped in. They grabbed probably a Hot Pocket on their way, ate it in the car, and then they showed up to chorus rehearsal. And I had guys, you believe the nerve of these guys? You know, showing up late like this. This guy didn't show up till 8 o'clock. Yeah, because he got the 746 train into Chatham home. And then thank God that he showed up to quarters, right? These guys would get all PO'd. You know why? Because these guys, the new guys, weren't collecting Social Security for a living like everyone else. So then you, you ran into this cultural dysfunction, right? And what I'm telling you before we get into the joint session is it's your job as a musical leader of the chorus to start taking on those problems. I know you say, okay, I'm the music director. It's my job to work on vowels and make sure you know the guys have their work. No, it's not. It, it is. But at the same time, your bigger job is going to be managing your guys in the people sense, making sure that they're on board. Because I'm telling you right now, and this is one of those things where, oh, Nate, I just need to learn how to do the class, and pick the music, and do the marketing. It's fine. The people that don't listen to this and they don't change that, it never works. Because if you, it, it's like a leaky bucket, you know, if we teach you how to put more water in a bucket with a hole in it, you ain't going to have no more water because there's holes in it. So that's where it's got to start. So anyway, <laughs> yeah, it's six weeks. Uh, we, we focus on six weeks. Um, we'll get into, you know, different six weeks of teaching. Uh, most of the time we do a seventh week for a graduation, but if you really need to squeeze it into six weeks, uh, you could. We like to do six weeks of classes and then a seventh week that's graduation. Okay. Um, to give you a format of how an average night looks under this, uh, so our course starts at 7.30. We usually start the night at 7.45 when we have ready, set, sing come in. So course rehearsal starts at, you know, so let's call it 7.45. We do a group warm-up with everyone there. So including, you know, the ready, set, sing guys, and the current chapter guys, we do a group warm up. Uh, we do that for a few minutes. Uh, then at that point, we would split off and the chapter would go in the back and have someone wave their hand and run the chapter through songs. And then I would teach a, a 30 minute you know, lesson, singing lesson in a group to these ready, set, sing guys. So I teach this 30 minute lesson, focus on a topic, um, and then while my chapter's back there rehearsing. At that point then, we bring people together and we go into sectionals to work on the song. I'll talk about you know song and repertoire in a second. We go into these sectionals to work on a song that we're all learning together. Um, and I'll talk about how people get placed and whatnot and voice placement and all that stuff. So we, we work on in sectionals for about 15-ish minutes. Uh, and then at that point we bring everybody back on the risers and we run through whatever part of the song we just worked on. Or, you know, if we've gotten a you know, part two or part three, we run parts one and two going into three, obviously. Um, so that's kind of how an average night looks. So you understand the timing of that. You know, you've got your warm up. So let's call, if we say like 745, your warm up will probably take like five minutes. The singing lesson can take anywhere depending on the night, 20 to 30 minutes. Um, 
the section will take 15 minutes, on the risers will take 15 minutes. It shakes out to about, for us, I mean realistically we have transitions, we, we bank about hour and 15, hour and 20 minutes, really, with, with everything all in and included. Any questions? When we split off, someone in my chapter will take the guys that'll warm up for, you know, or they'll sing through songs and repertoire for 20, 30 minutes while I teach the lesson out here. If you think, and, and that's another thing too, if you think your assistant director is better off teaching the lesson, I'm usually more to say, hey, this is pretty important, so you want to make sure you're the one, because you're, you're the one that these guys are going to connect with at the end of the day, right? You're the director. So I, I would say that's the most important thing you could do. Instead of saying, oh, well, I've got to drill my guys on. You know, they just, you have someone in your chapter could do it, even if you don't know a format of the night. Do you have a lot of do you have a lot of your guests stay? That's a good question. So, um, and and, I, and there's a couple things to say to that. So we do usually have guests that just stick around and are like, "Hey, this is a lot of fun. I'd love to, you know, uh, can I hang out? Can I can I do that?" We always say, "Hey," because um, it's usually about the halfway mark. Like it'll usually be around like 8:45 or 9. We'll finish up with the class. We'll say, "Okay, we're taking a break." Uh, feel free to stay, but you guys are, are good to go for the night. I'll see you next week or pick up music or anything like that. At that point, because we're doing our break where we usually grab some coffee and some cookies and people at the bathroom anyway, the guys usually wrap an arm around the guy, talk to him, and if they want to stay, they'll stay, and sometimes they hang out. But one thing I'll tell you is don't put a direct correlation in your mind between who stays for the second half of rehearsal and who actually joins, because like in the last program we did, we had... I'd say probably three guys that would stay for the second half of rehearsal. Out of the, what do we have, 12 come through the last program, and but we wound up having 10 join. So it, it's really, if you set the expectation, it's part of its expectation, right? Because the guy probably told, so a lot of the guys were worried, you know, even when I first started, oh, these guys aren't staying, they don't love it, man. Oh. No, they probably just told their wife, oh, I'll be out at, I'll be out at nine, okay? Okay, can it, she'll be like, can you be home to put the kids to bed? Yeah, sure, and he took off, and they haven't made that arrangement. you got to understand, I know we've all had our, a lot of you guys have had Tuesdays booked from, you know, uh, December 5th, 1960 through, you know, 2072. So, you know, it's whatever your chorus night is, is sacred to you, but you got to understand, this is disruptive when you throw this in someone's schedule, especially when they do things other than, you know, nothing. you, you got to realize this is disruptive, so that could play in. So don't put a direct correlation on that, but obviously just keep it open and open the door for them. But when they come in the door, you have to uh, obviously voice test them. Uh, general rule with voice testing is um, if they have a, a reasonably higher voice, make them a lead. If they don't, make them a bass. Um, I, I think there's a, a circle in hell where you have people that come in the door and have to sing baritone the first time. <laughs> so, yeah, you want to make sure. Yeah, if you want to keep guys, that's usually not your best plan. Yeah. Hey, oh, you, you like this? Great, I'm going to make you sing fifths and flats out and yeah. I hope you really enjoy your night. Um, no, that, that, that's not really what you do to guys. And unless they, you know, have some great experience with tenor. Uh, you know, if they're a hot chart, you know, if it's a guy who said, oh, I, I sung, I've done this, I do church, you know, he goes through the whole thing, and, and he, you can tell he's good, you could put him on a, a harmony part. I, there's been, out of all the guys we've had through the door, there's only been like a couple times where I actually threw someone right on baritone. I think it was like probably twice. There was one time where a guy's like, I sing T1 in choir, I have a great falsetto range, and I threw him on 10. Other than that, leader bass. And then after the fact, what I'll usually do if there's a guy who I think could be good enough and just has no confidence, I'll throw him on like lead, and I think he could be a good baritone, I'll throw him on lead, and then he'll be like, you know, it's a little too high, I'll be like, oh, you want to sing baritone? Yeah, okay, and then I put him there, and that's how I get him there, so just, just to be honest <laughs> right afterwards. Um, but um, most of the time it's just leads and basses, okay? Don't, don't do that to a guy where you make him sing baritone the first time he's ever sung. That's, he's not going to like it, just to be honest. Um, so I do voice placement. The voice placement test pretty much looks like this. Don't call it a test. Just think, I just want to do like a little checkup. Just make it, oh, hey, Joe, come with me, right? Because he's probably signing your guest book. Uh, you say, hey, Joe, come with me, right? You take Joe off in the back. you got a couple guys greet him. And then you say, hey, Joe, um, glad to have you here. Uh, you ever do anything with music before? You ever sing? And then, you know, he'll say yes. He'll say no. 
will say, you know, my wife hates what I sing, you know, whatever they say to you in the shower, it doesn't matter. So then I just pretty much start off with the pitch mastering. I'll be like, can you just match this? Ma, 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 you know, I'll do that. Um, and I'll see where he's at pitch wise. And then I'll do some scale, just like a, a low scale or a high scale. I'll see if he's better off as a leader bass. And then depending on how he falls into it, I'll probably take him in the other room and say, okay, um, so you, you're a bass. I'm gonna put you with your riser buddy. Chris over here, Chris, this is Joe. Okay, neat. So you're gonna stick with, you're gonna be with Chris like glue whenever the chorus is together. When you're in the race, that sing lesson, Chris is gonna be in the back. But other than that, you, you and Chris are gonna hang out, right? So I pair them with the riser body. A couple things that I should talk about that just occurred in there. Um, I'm, I'm evaluating how good and if you can pitch match, right? Because a couple things that always come up is, are you gonna get some people that come in the door that are truly tone deaf? Absolutely, okay? You're going to say, you know, I've always wanted to sing, but everyone tells me I can't. And you're going to be like, you're right. Okay. <laughs> uh, no, that's, yeah. that, that, that's the reality, right? You ever have that where it just kills you because this guy comes in, he's a smiley, loving a guy, and he just can't match pitch for anything, right? So that's the one scenario. So you need to be aware of that and you pair them accordingly. The other thing is based on how good this guy is or how, like, the vibes you're getting from him when you're talking to him, you're going to decide how like high of a heavy hitter in your chorus you're going to pair him with. So if I get a guy who I really like, uh, he's got a great natural voice, things like that, I'm going to pair him with, you know, the best possible guy I can in that part, right? Because, uh, you know, and, and then I'm going to kind of go into sending water, right? So if you get a guy, uh, and I'm not saying this, uh, you've all got great guys in your chapter, but you know, hey, if I got this guy who's a bass and I really want him to stick around, I should probably put him with this guy because he's a great singer, he's a great guy, he's going to be a lot of fun, he's going to support him. You know what I mean? That, so you want to make a smart decision there. Um, the, the other real scenario I just want to talk about with the, the tone deafness thing, because this comes up a lot, people ask me about this all the time in classes, is, okay, well, what do we do? Because there's a guy who kind of hits pitch half of the time, but then the other half of the time, he, you know, he can't really, you know, he's floating around, he's, he doesn't know what's going on. So we got to realize that pitch, we're very good at matching pitch, probably, well I hope so for directors, but we can match pitch pretty well and, and tune and do things like that. But we've probably been using this, the muscles in our brain that do that, you know, and I, I know there's no muscles in your brain, but we've been probably using the part of our brain that does that for a long time, probably since we were a child. There's people that come in the door that have literally not sung since elementary school music, and they'll be in their 60s and 70s. So have they been using the pitch recognition part of their brain? Probably not. But if I can tell it's there and it's just weak, I treat it like a muscle that can be built up over time. And you know, when it comes to the reality of it, um, you know, people say to me, okay, you guys are growing so fast, but you know, even when it pans out with things like contests and things like that, when you have guys that are coming in the door constantly and they have very weak pitch recognition muscles, I don't, I'm not gonna throw that guy out, okay? I'm not gonna say, if he's a good guy, he wants to sing, he wants to be a part of it, he's gonna be a part of my chapter. And I'm going to invest the time and work with him. And I know his first few cigarettes out the door, he is going to blow every other chord. I know he's going to, you know, he's going to be struggling in rehearsals. But I'm going to invest the time. And I'll tell you, there's plenty of guys that only can come over the top on this. That when they come in, it's every fifth note, right? And after about six months, they're, they're up to where over 50, 60% of them are, are they're actually on pitch. But it's really just building up that muscle, and that's why a lot of my warm-ups and stuff are focused on that, because I know that these guys have it in them. They just Damn. never had it. I had a guy who literally said to me, he joined the chorus, um, great guy, works, works like a dog, and this is the only thing he does outside of work. And he said, Nate, I literally haven't listened to music since high school. I mean, that blows my mind. He goes, I don't even listen. He goes, I never had an iPod, I never had... CD player, he said, I was just always working. Never, I was never like a music guy. But he's found us, he loves it. It's his, if he doesn't even listen to music, how good do you think his pitch recognition muscles are going to be, right? But that's something where I have to make the investment. And that's, you know, just to give you a little bit of a real talk aside, that's a, a challenge you're going to have to take on as a director if you want to. Me, personally, if there's a guy who's great and wants to sing and I think he's going to be a positive contribution to my chorus, it's going to be a cold day in hell before I turn him away. Am I going to lose points at contest because he's going to be, yeah, absolutely. Is it going to be some rough sing outs? Uh, yeah, but you know what? In the long run, if we're bringing good guys into our society that I know in two years are going to be okay, 
that's an investment in my chapter that I have to make. And that I love to make. And I'll make it every time. Uh, and we can talk about things you can do in the long run to help those guys out too. Um, so that's kind of what happens with that. If they're straight out tone deaf, um, I, I pretty much let them do the course anyway. I'm, I'm not going to be throwing them out because it, this is a public service. If the guy wants to try, maybe something will click in his brain. I don't know. But I'm going to let those people go through the course every time. And I'll just... Great. So uh, another couple things to think about with this. Uh, so we've, we've paired them up. We have all that stuff going on with a riser buddy. Um, they're going to exchange contact info with the ready, set, send guy. Um, and, and this is something I know Mike will probably talk about too, but I, I think it's really important <coughs> to drive it home. If you just have a guy show up on a Tuesday night or a Monday night or whatever you guys rehearse, show up and he leaves at 9 o'clock on that Tuesday night and he's not going to hear about you guys until 7.30 the next Tuesday, that's a long time without contact. The way we design it, and this is partially on you as a director, so I just want to outline this now. Um, I give that guy, I send a blanket follow-up to the class. Hey, class, uh, hey, Ray, you said sing guys, hey, class. Uh, I love the, the work we did. You guys did a great job. Uh, here's just a quick outline of what we worked on, you know. And I'll outline the five, you know, the, hey, we worked on this. Just remember to practice this and measures 1 through 16 on the blah, 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 blah song, right? So, yeah, email. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah. So anyway, uh, no, we've got some logistics stuff there. So uh, I'll send that out to the entire Ready, Set, Sing class, right? At that point, too, I'll probably send out, as the director, at least the first week, I'll probably send out a personalized, maybe a day later or something. Um, hey, Joe, just want to say great job. I really appreciate what you did. I'll send him a personal touch, too, at that point, right? Um, then also I have the riser buddy at some point that week reach out with an email and say hey uh, Tom great to have you um, you know I'm here for you if you have any questions uh, how's the practicing going um, please feel free to reach out to me here's all my contact info right so that means that that guy just got uh, a blanket touch to all the race that's in guys he got a personal touch from me he gets a touch from and then he gets a touch from his riser buddy so that's three people in the chapter in a week coming over to the top to let him know he's welcome, let him know he's got all the support in the world, and if he needs anything, he's good. So how much better is, does that sound than when you just have a guy, all right, hope to see you next week. Guess what? That don't work. Because like I said, if you even want to stay on him, like make sure one of those touches is the night before rehearsal. Because like I said, he doesn't have Tuesday night or Monday night booked out from here until 2072 like you do. So make sure you're stay, staying on top of the schedule. Make sure you're aware. You know, if he doesn't come back for a week, give him a call. There's lots of stuff that y you can do. But just be smart about that. So that's that with the riser buddy. Any questions about that? Is there an information form that you ask them to fill out? When you come yeah, we have them fill out. We just sign a guest book, and it's like name, email, phone number, town. Um, just so we know. And the other reason we take town is so that we know if there's someone who lives nearby. It's a guy, hey, I can't really come, I can't drive at night. We can look and say, oh, you live in Madison? Oh, Joe lives in Madison, we'll have you guys carpool together. Not that we ever have members that can't drive at night, but um, <laughs> that's, uh, no, it's, it's a reality. Uh, we have, great, song, uh, song choice, because this is important. Um, if you think you're gonna get a guy in the door and you're gonna you know, hook him with, you know, uh, in the good old summertime or, or Sweet Roses and Warren or something like that, that, that's not the way to go. Are there guys that are going to come in the door and fall in love with that? Absolutely. Okay. But my whole goal when I pick a song for Ready, Set, Sing is I want to pick a song that spans generations, right? I want to pick a song that can appeal to someone on the older end, but it's also going to appeal to someone on the younger end. Like I, like I tell people, you kind of want the, the gateway drug of songs is what you look for. You want to get something that gets them in the door and gets them hooked. Because if they show up the first week and you're like, great, we, we got great stuff, you know. Oh, uh, you, so you're Tim, you're, you're 30, okay, that's great. Uh, here's your song. Now, have you heard this one? There'll be no new tunes on this old piano. You know, and it's like, no, no, oh, you haven't heard that one? Oh, okay, what about, no, no, you haven't heard that one anyway? Oh, okay, I'll take you home again? No, no, it just doesn't resonate with them, right? But if you get something that's exciting that applies our four-part barbershop harmony principles, 
to something a little more relatable that kind of spans generations, you're, you're good. So I'll, I'll just run you through some of the ones that we've done, and I'll tell you honestly what I think of all of them in retrospect. Some of them have been awesome. Some of them might have chosen differently. Uh, first one we did right out of the gate was like something in the way she moves, uh, the Beatles one. We did the Banana Boat song. We did Country Roads, um, the Rita Craig one. We did um, Still of the Night. We did Hooked on a Feeling. And we did For the Longest Time. So to go through it, something in the way she moves. Um, it was good. I don't know if a ballad's the best choice, to be honest with you. Um, I think it uptunes the, the best option just for, you know, give them something peppy, something enjoyable, you know, uh, so I don't know. That, a rhythm song. Yeah, a, a rhythm song. Yeah, an up tune, that's probably your best. Uh, Banana Boat song was awesome, super singable, super easy, and that's something that someone my age is going to recognize, that's something someone who's 80 is going to recognize and enjoy. You know, it's a timeless song. Um, Country Roads, awesome. You know, it's just a, that was a great arrangement. Everybody knows Country Roads, young and old. Um, then we've got more like, uh, what were the other ones? Uh, oh, the Still the Night was awesome. You know, that's another easy, beautiful, audiences love it. Um, Hooked on a Feeling was pretty difficult. I don't know. Uh, I got the Society Sample, which was the first minute, and then all the hard stuff started at 101. <laughs> so, uh, and then, uh, you know, we got it right in at the end. Uh, I don't know if I would have done that one again as already said sing song, uh, but it was it was great and it worked out and it did sound great. But the audience loved it because it was a fun song and they enjoyed it anyway. Um, and then what else? Uh, for, the for the longest time. Too many words. Okay. It's a lot of words. I'll tell you what though, the guys did it. I don't know how they did it, but they did it and it was awesome. That was our most recent one we did this past June and we got like nine or ten guys out of the race that sang. They loved it. And uh, I'll tell you when the chorus sings it out. It's a hard one because there are a lot of words and you just gotta. Direct, you know, you got a director lead, you know, give them the right cue off on that one. But what? Yeah, but you don't tell them. You know what the best part about stuff like this is? You don't tell them it's a high one for lead. Um, what you guys got to realize is, as the directors, this is a great opportunity for your course, right? Because how many people tell their guys, hey, you got to learn measures one through twenty-four for next week, and, and they don't learn measures one through twenty-four. Right. Right, every hand of the so what happens and Oli I think could speak to this really well he, he remembers so we had you know the chapter we had a bunch of that stuff when we first started so I remember we were doing the banana boat song we had like six bases that came in just the way it fell because it was just leads and bases I think we had like 14 in that class already said saying six of them were bases so we start off banana boat I say okay for next week you're gonna learn measures you know one through 24 or whatever it was so my guys are like yeah you know Nate's gonna teach it anyway. They, they knew it, you know, that's, uh, oh, well, what, we don't think that happens? Our chapters are like, oh, yeah, they're going to teach it anyway. Yeah, we'll do it say, who, yeah. who cares, right? Yeah. But the guys from Race at Sing didn't know any better. So they show they up, learned. and they learned it. And then the guys in my chapter are like, you bastards. <laughs> <laughs> who do you think you are coming in here actually doing your work, right? So that, that it started, that my guys get pissed off, right? And they're like, oh, we better actually learn it for next week. And then it was like a, a great escalation because all of a sudden now we have an infusion of guys that are pushing the level. They might not be the best singers, but they were at least learning all the stuff. And that actually brought our music learning speed up just because that upped the level and, and changed it. Um, so, yeah, i, I got to say to that, it, you know, just pick a fun song. Don't pick an old barbershop song, please. You could get them hooked on that later, but get them something that comes in the door. Get them something you think they'll want to sing. Something that try and pick a song seriously. And you might want to do this. I'll call people. I would ask my dad, because my dad's like, you know, 54. I'd be like, hey dad, what do you think of this song? He'd be like, uh, I never heard it. Okay. Alright. What about this song? That song sucks. Okay. What about this song? Oh, that's a pretty good song. Alright. Then I'd call one of my friends that's my age. I'd be like, what do you think of this song? Never heard it. Okay, you like this one? Boom. And I try and find a song that I could get an older guy in my chapter who says, oh, that's a fun song. You get someone my age, you get someone my dad's age. And if I could get a song that all three of them knew and liked, then I would pick it. It's hard. And guess what? No one said you're a director for the team. Um, so I go through that process every time to find a song. And are you going to get guys, and that's the other reality of it, are you going to get guys that push back on you and say, oh, we don't want to get, I, I will literally tell you every single song. <laughs> Every single song. Yep. We can't sing. It's too hard. 
Too hot. Oh, no. Okay. There's, a, there's two key changes. Okay, get another set. You know, get another key ring. What do you want me to have? There's two key changes. Oh, this song's not. Okay, great. Yeah, shut up. Is what you said. And, and you say shut up, and you go, okay, no problem. And then they wind up singing it, and then the audience loves it. It works out anyway. Um, the other thing you're going to have is push back on the song. Um, and you're going to have pushback probably when you bring this back to a chapter on that point, the musical leadership point. You're going to get chapter pushback on how you run the course. I proposed this to my chapter's board three times because the first few, two times they said it, it sucked and it wouldn't work. I'm telling you, I, we designed the program as is. Present it to the board, no. Present it to the board, no. Present it a third time, they were like, all right, we got nothing to lose. And they did it, and that's how this worked out. But that's your job as director to keep pushing, right? So for song selection, you got that down, you got the risers, you got the buddies, you got um, anything that you have a question about that we've gone through so far. All of our repertoire is like that, nobody's going to be able to relate to that. If you throw in a song or two to show off what barbershop is amongst, amongst other things, but if you go to sing for an audience and it's all barbershop, they can't get their teeth into that right off the bat. If they've never heard it before, if they've never, you've got to find ways to keep it alive, right? And when your guys say, oh, well, we're a barbershop chapter, I said, we'll be a friggin' nothing chapter. Yeah. We're not going to be a chapter. We're going to be a chapter in the history book of failed chapters if you guys keep your crap up. <clears throat> and that's what you got to tell them. you got to push back on them with it. We, we good to roll, Oli? Yeah. Roll it? Oh, okay, good. So, anyway, um, uh, I, I got a couple questions about learning materials, which I, I think we're good. Our chapter does, just so you guys are aware, um, I think we'll have like three guys that will read sheet music too. So to, to the guys, we always give out learning CDs, um, we give out the sheet music, and if they want MP3 so they could, if they want MP3 emailed to them, you know, we'll give them that option too. Um, and I, if they say they just want MP3 emailed to them, they're going to listen to it on their iPhone or their computer, we'll save the money on the CD and save the, the trouble of printing out the label and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, for learning media, we give them everything. There's no hold them back. There's no, oh, make sure, just just give it to them. Just, and don't skip on the CDs. I mean, if you get some from society, it's, what is it, 16 bucks plus the, the mechanical license fee for the repeated. I mean, right. yeah, it, what's it worth at that point? You're talking about the regular chapter or the, or the, Both. the, new, the new? Everyone. When well, we're learning a song, I give everyone all of the learning media from day one. Their first week, they're going to learn without ever hearing the CD, doing anything like that, we're going to teach by rote in the lesson uh, uh, the opening of the song, right? The way I think about teaching the song, and uh, we can go with this and then we'll get into the lesson, is if we have six weeks to prepare it for a graduation, and I should probably bring up graduation, we have six weeks to prepare it and then seventh week is graduation or five and six is the graduation, the way I think about it is I want to get that song done and it should be a song that I can more or less get to the end of in four weeks. Split it into four, right? Weeks five and six are polish and applying stuff. Week seven is graduation. Or four weeks, week of polish, pre-show polish, you know, for the graduation. Any questions about that? You keep mentioning polish. Is that, I'm sorry, you keep mentioning graduation. Uh, is that a, a program that you put together? Yeah, so I should probably bring that up. I know Mike's talking about it, but I'll, I'll just give you guys the basic rundown here in the directors. So graduation is, pre it, that's like the, the cherry on, on top of the Sunday right here for this program. The whole thing is they work for six weeks on learning this, and at the end, for graduation, we tell them to bring their friends and family in. <clears throat> we bring our friends and family in. We have it like a party. It looks like an afterglow type party. And the chorus will sing a couple songs. We'll have a quartet sing a few songs. Quartet will usually open it up while I'm warming up the chorus, including the right set sing guys. Um, then the chorus comes out, sings two or three fun songs. And then for, for the finale, for the finale, we call up our right set sing guys who've been sitting in the audience with their families. Hey, we just want to bring up our ready set sing guys, and boom, they come on up and they sing the song that they've been working on. So that's why when I tell you, do an up tune. Uh, do an up tune, that, that's great. Think about something that's a show close yeah. that you could do and the guys are going to be jazzed about. So I call them all up there and then I say, um, okay, you know what, we had a lot of great guys, I just want to thank them for all their stuff. Mm -hmm. And I present them with some type of cert funny certificate. Uh, just to be honest, I think we take ourselves too seriously with stuff like this. 
Uh, usually what I do is I come up with some type of gag that has to do with the song we sang that's, you know, funny. So like we did the banana boat song, we, we got these big plastic bananas and I, and I wrote that on them, thanks for singing on the boat with us and ready, set, sing three and, you know, signed it or when we did Country Roads Take Me Home, you know, I, I printed out a big map of where we rehearsed and I put a star and I was like, hey, Clay, thanks for, you know, coming home with us and, you know, I framed it. We, we just do gag stuff. For the longest time I got these cheap plastic watches. And, you know, we gave each guy a watch with his name on the back of it, right? He said, saying, and they were, they were crap. And then they just broke before I even took them out of the package. But it was just like a, it, it, was, it was a funny thing, you know. Do something like that that you think will put on his mantle. You know, I got giant light bulbs for um, Still the Night because I was like, hey, uh, think about what you knew before the light. And then it was like, ready, set, saying, you know, just, just little jokes that have to do with that. We do that. And then if we give them certificates, they're usually a wisecrack, like, um, you're now certifiable or something like that. They're, they're, they're just jokes, but um, yeah. The final song, the only the ready set singer. Not no, together with them. everyone. Everyone. The whole goal is to give them the experience of singing a song a cappella with a chorus and get to experience that and then share that because then they're sitting in the audience with their families, right? Watching your chorus do some fun numbers, not once again, you know, old crusty polecat, you know, that type of stuff. Don't do that. Sing your fun up tunes that they'll actually recognize. You do that, then you bring that. So they're sitting in the audience saying, boy, this is fun. Their family's clapping. You're doing a great job. And then they get called up. And they're part of the finale, right? So now you call them up. You're sitting there and you give them the certificate. So now they feel special. I, I call each guy individually. You say a nice thing about him. Give him his banana or whatever it is. And then he goes up on the rise. We take a picture. And then he goes up on the risers and he sings this fun song. The audience goes wild over it. That's my husband. That's up there. my husband up there. The woman, and I, it's the kids. You know how many times you have the the kids are sitting there like this. <laughs> I can't believe. And then you talk to the, the the daughter afterwards. I can't believe my dad could sing. Oh my god! You know, you're just like sitting there going through. Or uh, you know, the, the 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 stories you get from that are just hilarious because a lot of these guys that have never sung before will be like. My husband sing? I was shocked, you know? Or, you know, oh, my friend Joe. And then a lot of the time, we've had times where they bring a friend who's like a neighbor, and then he says, oh, can I try it? And then he winds up coming as a guest. And that's the other thing. Encourage them. If there's someone who's into it, encourage them to bring people along. Um, but anyway, so, so we do the graduation. They sing for the finale, and their families love it. And then at that point, they're on a high. They're feeling good about it, and then guess what? They're going to get to interact with all the great guys in your course and their families. So now, and, and this is the reality of it too, because a lot of people ask me about this. They say, they say, hey Nate, you know, well you have, you have the people's families, you have that. Let, let's be honest. If the guy, if the guy's wife doesn't know what's going on on a Tuesday night, or his family, or his friends, right? How open do you think she's going to be to him going? Dip, disappear out of the house from 7 to 10, 15, or whatever it is with the commuting, right? She's going to say, what the hell are you doing? I'm leaving. Oh, you're doing this thing. But if you bring her in and his family in, and they see it, and they go, boy, what a nice thing. And then the wife said, oh, aren't these great people? Aren't they, if they come and they feel like they're part of a family, they're going to, the wife, they're going to be happy. Uh, I have a guy that just joined a year ago, and I saw his wife at a Starbucks around the rehearsal. And yeah, she comes up and she said, you know, this is exactly what Peter needed when he came. You know, he just worked so hard, and you know, when I met you guys, and she said, "This is," I was happy that he was part of this because this is just what he needed in his life. And that's why you're trying to get the family hooked. You're trying to have them say, "It's not that you're getting them hooked; it's that they're realizing you don't have to put on a show. You don't have to do anything that's not true. You're having them realize how good barbershoppers are, and how we're great people, and how we've got great families, and everything. And they're just—it's just building the okay. This is legit. And then once you get that, you have the family support, and the guys can join. Any questions with that? So, so uh, real quick before we get to lessons on weeks five and six, that's where I—that's the only time throughout the course where I pull the guys in to talk to them about anything related to to membership, right? And this is how it goes. So I've gone through five or six weeks of the course with them, right? So I pretty much pull them in and I say, okay, I'm just going to take a one-minute session with everyone just to talk to them. So I pull a guy in the back room. The other guys are sitting out there. And I say, this is how the conversation goes. I say, hey, Joe, um, you know, I, I do this because when I first started doing the course, people said they felt like they never got a chance to talk to me or give me feedback. So I just want to say, how do you enjoy the course? And then I'll say, oh, I loved it, it was good, or oh, you know, I wish it was this. Did it meet your expectations? Yeah, okay. 
Um, and if you judge by what he's saying, oh, I loved it. This is so much fun. This is great. Um, and if I know, you're going to know how he sings because you're teaching him the lesson and, you know, making sure. And like I said, as long as they can hold pitch, you know, enough that you know it's there. So I say, okay, that's great. If they're saying they loved it, it was great. I say, well, I just wanted to say, this is something I'm bringing up just because we had a lot of guys that didn't realize it when they went through the course originally. But if you, you know, were looking to join, we'd love to have you. If this is something you want to keep doing, past race and sing, we'd love to have you join the course. And that's it. There's no selling. If you have to sell a guy on joining your course, either A, you don't have a fun enough program, or B, he's not going to be that good because he's going to be a pain in the butt just going forward anyway, just to be real, right? He should have had so much fun that you don't have to sell, you just have to open the door. I had a guy, this is honestly got truth, and only can come over the top on this, and our last ready set saying, it was week five, and one guy said, make sure you talk to Scott tonight. I said, okay, make sure you talk to Scott tonight. So I pull Scott in, I have this conversation with him, and uh, I'm like, okay, Scott, well, how do you enjoy the class? Oh, it's so much fun. I've been looking for something like, it's so much fun. And he goes, I'm so sad it's ending. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, he's like, oh, I just wish, I wish I could keep doing this. And I was like, he was telling his riser buddy how sad he was that night. And I was like, what do you mean? He was like, I just really wish I could join the chorus. You know, it stinks that I can only sing for with you guys for six weeks. And he was telling everyone this. Then he comes in, I said, Scott, you know you could join. Really? <laughs> I could join? Yeah, you could join. But I was just here for the class. No, 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 you can keep going out. Really? Okay, yes, yeah. He was so pumped. This kid was literally walking around. He's younger, he, he, he's you know, in his early 20s. He's walking around, he's like, oh, I just really stinks. I'm gonna miss this, it's so much fun. I wish I could do it every week. You can. <gasps> and he was just completely over the moon. But here a guy is, Completely not understanding that he could be, you know, part of it. And then the other thing is, you get guys that are great. You know, we got a guy who came in. Um, he's now my base section leader, Chris. He comes in and he's. I say, oh, have you ever sung? Uh, I sang a little bit in high school. And here's a guy who's, you know, mid mid sixties. So I'm like, oh, okay. The guy sings like a lark, and I and I say to him, you know, well, I thought you said you haven't sung. Well, I mean. You know, I drive a lot, you know, I, I sing through, you know, a whole late Miz album, you know, I'll just sing through that in the car, I sing through that, he goes, you know, I've just been singing musicals in the car my whole life, I'm just like, I don't know what to sing, huh? he says, but I don't really sing, you know, and then you get guys, and then when I go to, hey, do you want to join, oh, I don't know if I'm good enough, yeah, you're okay, you're okay. <laughs> better than everyone else, just, yeah. just come, you know, like, they just don't even realize that. And Chris is our base section leader. Yeah, and he's our base section leader, our secretary, and it was just someone who didn't even realize, had no concept of... So sometimes you'll say to these guys, and they really don't realize, if you do it well enough, that should almost be the reaction. They don't realize they're getting sold, yeah. because they're not getting sold. And, and you have to tell your members, too, that's another thing. You pull your members aside, and you know, pull out some type of sharp or heavy object and say, don't talk to guys about joining, or else, and point to it. You know, Let them know, here, you see this ax? Don't talk to guys about joining. Just pick something, because you have to drive home the point that if they come in and it's like sharks on chump. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're young. Oh my God. Could you see tenor baritone at the same time? You know, it's like they, they, they jump right on them, right? That's what happens in every chapter. Guess what? Nobody's going to want to join. You wouldn't want to join. It, 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 you know, it's like you're getting 12 telemarketers calling you all at the same time when you have the guys jumping on. Like, it feels like crap. I talk and I said, hey guys, first of all, make it. You don't recruit anyone. You know, if they come up and they say, pretty much say, so you know what, that's fine. Nate will talk to you, be like, don't worry about it. You know, Nate will talk to you about it later. Nate will talk to you about it at the end. If they come and they just always defer to me. Make the guy want it. You know, if the guy wants it, he's asking people, that's great. And then that member tells me, you know, we just split that up. But yeah, so then the guy comes and talks to me later, but they let me know, hey, someone's always asking about joining. I make a mental note of it, or I'll probably put it in my rehearsal notebook. Joe has asked about, you know, and then I'll, I'll think about that. And then when I follow up, I can say, oh, I know you were actually asking some people about joining. We really appreciate what you're doing. Would you like to join? The only other scenario here I have to point out is if someone wants to join, but they're so toned up to the point that you think it would be hurtful, you were, you know, it would be, if it would hurt your organization, the guys would enjoy it. You say, hey, listen, uh, you know, I understand you love to sing. Uh, uh, I don't feel like it would be fair to you or to my guys to sing with the chorus, right? You wouldn't enjoy it. 
you would be, feel like you're messing things up. But what I do is, and I usually give the number for a local voice teacher who's worked with some of the people that have had pitch issues in the past. So I give them that number and I say, hey, give this a shot if you can make any progress. You know, feel free to come see us in a few months, you know. Because chances are it's a great guy, but if he can't, it's not fair to him or anyone if he's on coach. Okay? Um, so that's that. Any other questions about that before we go into the actual lesson? How do you, or do you handle with this, with this format, people that don't start the first night? Do you allow anybody to come in night three, night four? Yes. Okay. They can come in night 12. Like, I'm super open to work. Like, whatever it is, and I'll try and catch them up. And the way you should teach your lesson, and the way I'll go through it, is you recap everything that's happened leading. The way I start off every lesson every week, especially the first week, is I have the guys, you know, just sit down, we talk, we all have the guys all introduce themselves. It's very useful because that way they hear someone else say, okay, I sang in high school, and they know, oh, I didn't sing since high school. They hear, they'll hear someone else say, I've never sung before. You want to make sure the guys don't feel alone. The thing you have to keep into account here is ego the whole time because you have to realize how sensitive, and I'll make points about ego throughout, for someone who's gone 60-something years of their life and they've never sung before, and now that you have to understand that singing is a very personal thing. And for some of us, it's, oh, we've been doing it so long we don't even know, you know. But, you know, we came out of the, the womb, you know, tap dancing, singing, putting on the Ritz. But, you know, <laughs> some of us, it's not the case. And some of these guys are really scared, especially you have a guy who's got his whole life, had a successful career, and he could just be terrified of singing in front of someone. We had a guy in the chapter that came, and I know you know exactly what I'm talking about. This guy, great career, executive, all that stuff. He had to sing in a quartet once, and we were doing a quartet activity. He got so embarrassed that he messed up, and he never came back. Here's a guy that had a long career, executive, all this stuff. And to me, that was an eye-opening experience, because I said, this guy was you know, the epitome of confidence. We don't realize how personal singing is sometimes because we've, you know, I don't want to say we're numb to it, but it's it's really scary for a lot of people. And a lot of people are really scared to mess up. So we always have to be constant that we're kind of hedging our bets with the ego, right? We have to make sure we're showing them they're not alone. We have to make sure we're not calling them out. We have to make sure we're rewarding them when they're doing things throughout this whole process. And I'm going to talk about that different ways throughout. So first night I open it up, I have everyone open up, oh okay, and this is just the race that sing guys, oh I'm Joe, I, I, I sang in high school, oh I'm Tom, I've never sung before, blah blah, we go through, okay. At that point um, I, I just talk a little bit and uh, I'll say, I tell them my story, I tell them that I, and, and the one thing I had gone for me is I was originally classically trained trombonist, I didn't learn how to sing until I was 18. So I can tell them like I designed this around you know, having, and I know some of you guys have underwear that's older than 18 years, but still, like, uh, it's me saying as an adult, <laughs> you know, raise his hand, uh, but saying that I'm, I learned how to sing as an adult is something that I, I just personally, if you're in that situation, throw it out there because that's, that's reassuring to them. Um, so at that point, I pretty much call them all up and we start the class. So what we're, can we all step back like three, let's step back even with the end of that there, or however, just. Yeah, let's get that. I just want to make sure we have enough room. You guys are good. You guys are good. So, a couple inside tips and why we do things this way. Why The reason I do two lines is because as I teach, and we'll go through some of this, we're demoing for each other. So I'm going to have one line sing, and then I'll have another line sing, and demo, and we'll go through things. And the reason this works is because, once again, if you have ten guys, three of them have never sung before, four of them sung, haven't sung since high school, they want to see that they're not alone, right? And when you're sitting here exposed to each other, but you're with a group, you're going to feel better about this. And it's going to be a lot easier to open up. When they see other people struggle, they're going to realize they're not alone. When they see other people that do a great job, you know, when they see the results of what you're saying and you demo, then it's, oh, okay, so now it's, oh, wow, this is good. This is good stuff. I watched the difference when they did what Nate said. Wow, now they're really, they're, they're hitting home. So you want to think about that. So, uh, first night is all about getting them singing. Like I said, you don't start off with posture, you don't start off with breathing. Some of these guys have never sung before. So, what do you think is the natural connection that will get them singing? What have they done? Speech, Speech right? It all starts. Yeah, yeah. Don't have them say hello. You know, it, it never ends. But um, so it's all about connecting from speech. There's a book I recommend, um, and I think I put it in the notes, but you guys can write it down when you sit down. Uh, the Naked Voice by um, Stephen Smith. Great book. 
Uh, it really just talks about connecting speech to singing, and that's where I've got a lot of this type of stuff and crafted it from. So the exercise he does that I think is great, really gets them started, is called na, 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 no, no. So what I have them do is I just say, say the words na, 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 no, no. Na, 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 no, no. Okay, great. Now can we say that word and can we just stretch it out a little like na, na. Can we do that? Na, na, na. We stretch it a little bit longer, like na na. Watch me, na 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 no no. Now, great. Can we say that to the person standing across the way from us? Say it like you're trying to say it so that they can hear it and understand it. Nay. say that on a pitch. Let's try doing the same thing to the person across from us holding out that lung. Let's just add in a pitch. So if we all do it on na, 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 no, no. Now it's almost like we have directors and singers here, but what you want to remind them is don't sing it, right? And, and this is, so we have some, obviously we've saw them before, but what you're going to have is you're going to have a couple of things. You're probably going to have a guy that's sitting there going, nah, nah, you know, who's trying to sing, right? He's trying to sing, nah, nah, no, say, don't sing. Just say it on the pitch. Get him back to speak. Just say the word, nah, nah. Okay, now can you say that on the pitch, nah, nah. Now can we say that and just hold it out on that pitch. Don't tighten anything up here. You're probably going to have to remind them. And if a guy's really bad, walk up, you know, work him out a little bit, say, hey, Good job. You just relax as you're going through it. Just stuff like that. Don't single anybody out and help them. Nah, 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 no, no, no. Now, great. Can I get it? Instead of seeing if the person across the way, we do that the same way. Say that note on the pitch, <coughs> hold it out, but say it to the person who's standing against the wall. Can we do that? Now, can we say it to someone who's 20 feet beyond the wall? We're not going to yell, but how would you say it to someone who's 20 feet past that wall over there? <coughs> with projection, you sang it so someone in the audience would hear it, and you sang a note, so good job. Seems like a small victory, but you want to recognize it. Say, okay, so you sang a note. So let's take that and apply to something else. Can we just say the lyrics to the first verse of Mary had a little lamb? Let's so just say that, Mary, so just speak it. Mary had a little lamb. Now can we go, Mary had a little lamb. Just extend the speech. Mary had a little lamb. Now, great stuff. Can we say that like we're saying it to the person across the way with the extended speech? Mary had a little lamb. Now, great stuff. Can we get that on pitch? Mary had a. Mary had a little lamb. Now, can we get that on pitch to the person sitting against the wall? Mary had a little lamb. Now can we get that? If we put it on uh, the pitches, Mary had a man. Mary had a little lamb. Can we do that to the person sitting against the wall? Mary Mary had a little to the person sitting 20 feet beyond the wall. Ma Mary had a little Keep going. Lamb, little lamb, little lamb. Mary had a little 
Sad. And for some of these guys, it's like, like to you guys, it's like, oh, okay, somebody had a little limb. But some of these guys, it's, I just sang the song. That's a big moment for them. So at this point, you probably want to do a little bit of demo. So I'll grab, I'll jump in with this line. That's the other thing. As the director, when I'm demonstrating something, I'll probably jump in with the line just so they feel like they have someone to, to lean on. Not that anybody ever leans on anyone in a chorus, but so I'll probably jump in, feel like they have someone to lean on. So I'll say, let's do that and say it like we'll say the first Mary had a little lamb on the pitches, but say it to them, just the people that are saying across. Can we do that? Ma Mary had a little lamb. So you guys can just watch it. We'll do that one more time. You guys just watch. Mary had a little lamb. Now let's sing it to the person sitting against the wall versus them. Ma Mary had a little lamb. Now can we do that to the person sitting 20 feet beyond the wall? Mary had a little lamb. So at the, to, to this line, I'll ask, so what did you notice difference was? Got louder. Got louder. Intensity. It was more intense. But did you see these people struggling? Were they forced? Well, okay, probably at that point. I probably would have coached it up, right? No, I saw them get a little more energized. Yeah, and energized. That's, that's good. I'll take energized. Well, what you want to do is you open it up because now you're just validating all the stuff you just taught. So then I'd have this line and then demo it, right, if we were doing the full thing. And now these guys are saying, holy crap, it works. Because I probably, if I saw someone straight, I might say, no, 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 just speak it. And I might just coach it up a little bit <clears throat> kindly. And then they see validation of what I just taught. And everybody's on the same page at that point. Any questions about that approach? Your, your regular course is where? Off, off, off in the back with an assistant director okay. or, or someone who has a pulse and can wave their arm in a circle. <laughs> yeah, or both. Both. I'll take both. Um, yeah. So, any other questions about this? Um, this? Yeah. If any of your course members would like to participate in the actual vocal lesson, is there any kind of backlash about that? Um, yeah, I, I don't. Unless they're like brand new or something. Just have it be the fresh new guys. Okay. You do do craft. You should do craft weekly anyway with that. But to, to me, it's it's about this is about the new guys. You don't want to have them have some someone come in who's been around. It, it makes it feel odd, right? You want to make it feel like it's just their thing. It's completely separate from course. Any other questions about this first lesson? What do you guys think about this as a way to get guys singing? Yeah, I think it's super effective. Super. Okay. In cool. In fact, it's not a bad idea to use it with guys. Project. No, that's that's too that's too easy. You need to work harder. Do, 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 <laughs> you need to do some crazy stuff with judges. Oh, yeah, no, right. okay, no, I, I'm with you. Uh, okay, great. So I'll just go right into week two because we're all standing here. So week two, when you open it up, um, I have the guys sit down first, and we all talk. And what I way I open every week is I say, okay, guys, how did this week go? Um, what type of successes did we have? Any struggles? Any epiphanies? What do we want to talk about? And you open up and you let the guys talk. Okay, so, so the first night we didn't sing the song. Yeah. Yeah. Oh no no. After the, I'm just teaching the lessons right, right. now. After the lesson, then they'll go into sectionals with the guys from the chorus with their riser buddy, and then they learn that part of the song, and then they go on the risers after that. I'm just showing you guys how to teach the singing lesson. Okay. okay. Week two, but the way I open up every week is I say, share, hey guys, how was your week of practicing? Any epiphanies? Any struggles? Anything we want to share? And you're gonna learn. And you're going to learn from them. But what's great is you're going to have some guys that say, you know, hey, I'm struggling a little bit. I need help with this. And then you're going to have guys that say, wow, it was great. And they're going to perpetuate the good stuff. What do you guys think the biggest pushback, the biggest issue you're going to get weak to is? No, 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 I don't mean like lazy issue. I mean oh, saying lazy. No, if they, if they say they didn't have time, be like, oh, I'm pretty sure you got 24 hours a day just like me. No. But, uh, but they, I, you're not really going to. If they say that, just be like, oh, okay, that happens. You know, hopefully, you know, it gets better. But what do you think their biggest singing issue they're going to have when you open the door? Enough air. Great job, man. You must have heard this one before. Mm -hmm. So you're going to say, oh, I don't have enough air. Nate, I'm, I'm really running out, man. I'm getting out of phrases. I don't have it. And you're going to be tempted to go traditional BHS and teach them about air and, and breath that second week. But you know what? Yeah. Tell them no. You got to tell them no. You can't cave into that. Because if you teach them how to breathe now, the way I teach, explain it is I say, it'd be a waste of my time. Because right now, you're like a leaky tire, leaky bike tire. And if I can pump you full of air, it's just going to run out anyway. 
I need to teach you how to fix that tire up. I could give you all the air in the world right now, but it's going to be completely useless unless we go through the things we need to. I'll get to breathe in a couple weeks, but you need to stay with me because if I teach you how to get that air, it's not going to help you, I promise. So just trust me and stick with it. Okay? That's a good analogy. It gets them every time. Stick with it. So week two, though, what we think is most important, once again, is to go weeks two and three are, are tension and alignment, right? So, and the reason I tell them that is I say, hey, if you're not in alignment, you get all the air in the world, you can try saying the best you can, it's not going to work, right? So I know we're talking about not posture, but we'll talk about alignment, right? So what I usually do is, and I didn't bring it this time, you know those uh, cardboard dividers they put in like a, a, uh, like a case of beer bottles, right? Those ones in between. I usually take one of those and I hold it straight and I'll say, okay, so this is your body, right? What happens when I tilt it like this? And they see all the squares collapse and I'll say, you think you get a lot of air through there? No, no, no. Okay, is it going to be pressurized? Is it going to be tension? Oh, yeah, probably will. What about when you're like this? And then they see it and they go, wow, I'm wide open, everything's in alignment. You're building that proof. Why do you think, and this is an aside to the directors, why do you think we're working on tension and alignment weeks two or three? So when you do work on breathing, there's not as much resistance. Absolutely. And there's an even more practical reason. Okay, how much, here's what it is. How much do you think that guy is going to love coming to chorus every Tuesday night if he shows up and he sings and then he shows up at the door and his wife goes, how's the chorus, honey? Oh, it was great. Oh, we had so much fun. I smoked 12 packs of cigarettes. You know, like, if that's what the guy comes in because he's tense, we got to think, how do I make this the most enjoyable for the guy? And if the guy feels like his head's going to blow off and he's super tense as he's singing, he's shot. He's not going to enjoy coming to chorus because whether it's consciously or subconsciously, if he's walking out in pain, that's this isn't going to be good. If he's raspy the next day because he had chorus, he's not going to want to come back. So it's really, it's, it's part of making it good for them. It's part of enriching them because if they're loose and they, they are in alignment, they're going to enjoy the singing more. So anyway, so we come in and we, uh, so I talk about that. I show that little example. So I just go into some basic alignment stuff, right? So what I'll do is I tell them, you know, let's start off by getting your feet about shoulder width apart. Nice and bent at the knee. You know, you should feel nice and strong. You know, you should feel like if someone came up and pushed you, um, you wouldn't fall too far down the stairs. But, you know, you should feel like you're nice and good. Uh, you want to make sure your spine's in alignment. And you tell them, posture isn't, you know, like this. Say, posture is about just, and I don't use posture. It's about alignment. It's about getting everything so it's in the right place. Nice bent knees, nice feet shoulder width apart. You want to make sure your head is sitting over your spine, right? And you want to emphasize to them, that the way that we all are is like this, naturally, because we're on our phone, we're on the computer, we're working. This is, this is the natural default position for the human neck in the 21st century, right? So you want to tell them, hey, that's not right. You want to show them a little bit about how it's supposed to sit. And then I talk about, you know, having a nice lifted chest. The way I always do this is I tell them, hold out your head in front of you. Imagine it's your head looking at you. Uh, you handsome son of a gun, you know. And then you take that, lift it straight up in the air. Straight. Now I want you to slowly drop your head into where it is. Put it, hold it there for a second. And I want you, you're going to drop your hands, but you're going to keep your shoulders and chest in the same position. How's that chest feel? How are those shoulders? Nice and open. That's good. It's a nice, natural way. You might want to do it again just to clarify with the guys and tell them just to have your body centered and in alignment with your head to keep that chest and that in the same position. Ask them, how's that feel? If they say, I feel like I'm stuck here, they did it wrong. Say so it should be a nice, easy moment, right? No, or easy movement, I'm sorry. Natural opening. So then I'll go through some examples with this. I might do another. So always pick simple songs. One of the hardest things about this is just finding a simple song everybody knows and knows all the words to. Let's get um, America, uh, America the, uh, no, let's do uh, My Country Tis the So let's get My Country. So I'll walk through the same stuff. I'll recap from the week before. Na 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 no new in this position, right? We don't need to do that right now for time circumstances. Uh, or, or for time reasons, we're just gonna cut it a little short. But what we're going to do is probably get my country tis of thee, um, and let's so we'll demo with a line. So what I want you guys to do is get into a bad posture. I want you guys, you know, maybe a little bit of hump, what hump, you know, a little, a little bit of your Igor position. I want you guys to sing for them, my sing to them for that. 
My country is a thief, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. All right, yeah, beautiful, right? But that, by the way, that's what the new performance got. No, I'm joking. Anyway, so, all right, so now we need to just, now just stand normal, stand like you normally do in your day to day. You know, if you're waiting online or you're looking at the microwave, you know, waiting for that hot pocket to finish up. Say it like that and then sing. My, my country is a thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Okay, so uh, you're also probably going to want to emphasize and hear the same stuff you worked on in the first night about. No, no, no. Okay, guys, you're not singing. Just keep it relaxed. Speak. Speaking, oh, can I move? Okay, just keep a little bit of relaxed speaking, do it like this. I guess this is better for me standing here for demos. Um, so then, what you want to say then is, let's try it and let's get into that position. So get your feet shoulder width apart, get it nice and open, put that head on slowly, get these guys to do it, put it down, keep your chest and shoulders in the same place, make sure your head's not creeped forward. Good. My, and sing for them. My country is of the sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. At that point, I'll ask this line. What type of difference did you guys notice? Well, the sound was a lot better. Sound was, sound, was better. sound was a lot better, right? What do you guys think? And you feel a difference between each level, right? Mm -hmm. And you probably want to emphasize, I know this is exaggerated, but... Is it really that exaggerated for some of the members in your well, chapter? It's going to sound like this. Yeah. No, I, I used to have a director that you know I was playing an orchestra, and she said, you know, if you sit like you're on the toilet, that's exactly what you're going to sound like. So and, uh, I, I always hit my guys with that one. It's a good one. Yeah, you want to you want to use that one. Put that in the toolbox. But you know, this is is this an exaggeration? How many people have a guy that's probably more like this? Sings. You know, like a little bit of John Wayne. <laughs> coming out of the saloon, you know, like this, you get a guy who's like that. But seriously, then you get them to comment on the difference. And it's going to be a stark difference, right? I mean, even just listening to guys that know what they're doing, guys and gals that know what they're doing, it's a stark difference, right? So you have that validate, and then you ask these guys, hey, what did it feel like? Wow, it felt much better when I was like this. Holy crap, I didn't realize how easy this could be, okay? So you get them involved in that. Any questions about that? So once again, validation, demo, and getting them on the same page. Keep it simple. Give them something that's an easy win. So now they feel like they can feel better, less ten and, and just emphasize, you know, lack of tension, lack of tension uh, through that. That's week two. Any questions about that? Just try to do this for time. So to start off week three, do the same thing. Hey guys, how'd it go? Epiphanies, challenges, have them talk, they're still gonna ask, oh, you know, I'm still running out of breath at the end of the phrase. Say, just trust me, stick with me. It's like the leaky tire. You gotta you gotta get this. So we probably still have some guys tensing up, and at this point they're going to say, another issue is, you know, because you made it through probably half of the song by now, there's probably been a high note in, in one of the parts, right? So you're going to feel like, oh, you know, I'm just dying when I go for those high notes. So I say, so what do you guys do when you go for those high notes? You know, I tighten up and, you know, I squeeze the, I grab the ground with my toes, and, you know, you hear all this crazy fun stuff, right? And that's, you know, that's how I'm trying to hit the high note. You go, okay, so you guys are tightening up. So I usually open up and I say, how many people have ever heard of the Bernoulli Principle? All right. So the people that do usually say, okay, you make a mental note, these guys are going to be baritones. No. Um, <laughs> uh, but, but uh, all right, so Bernoulli Principle, tell me about it. Who, who raised a hand? We had a couple. Uh, basically, just the air um, going under a flat surface is going to be going faster than the air going above a uh, curved surface. Yeah, so it, it, yeah, it's a, it's a fluid dynamics principle that pretty much talks about you know low pressure to high pressure, lower pressure to high pressure. So I say it's involving a fluid, which air is a fluid. I know it's weird, but ask one of my baritones. Air is a fluid. Go on between two surfaces. It's going to pull them pull them together, push them apart, pull them together, push them apart because of the pressure difference, right? Mm -hmm. So otherwise, when we would pull up between two things, they would just blow apart every time. So. I say to myself, so I'm going to take these two pieces of paper, I'm going to apply the Bernoulli principle. So as I blow air between them, you're going to notice they don't just blow apart. They pull together and pull apart. Right? So I'll say, does that, does that look like what's going on? And they'll say, yeah. So I'll say, okay, so when I want them to vibrate faster, what am I going to do with the air? 
push them together a little. Or, well, no, no, no. What's going to make them go faster? What, is, what has to change with just the air? Velocity. The velocity. Right, the air is going to have to go faster. So for a lower note, it's going to be slower, right? But I want to make that note higher, and the air has to be faster. Right, and they can hear that difference, right? So that's how it gets faster. So what do you guys think happens when, so how many people think this is probably op, like something else in our body? And you ask them, what operates just like this? Your vocal, your vocal folds, right? And you want to emphasize your vocal folds are only about this big. You know, they're not these huge vocal cords that everyone thinks, you know, it's like, you know, Quasimodo ringing church bells, but it's, you know, they're very minute things. And you say it's just like your vocal folds. Yeah, it's about, I hear size of thumbnail, I forget what the actual size is. Just like your vocal folds. So, knowing this, what do you guys do when you go to reach for a high note? You tense up, right? You, you squeeze. How many people feel like they squeeze, squeeze a little bit, they tense up? This is even for us in real life, we all do it. Okay, so you feel like you do that. So you're telling me when you go and try and hit that higher note, what you do is you put pressure on, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So let's try that. How's that working out? No. Pretty badly, right? right? And then the guy says, what? How? So what do you think happens when you start to blow faster and then you put pressure on it? What do you think happens? It cuts it off. So then what do you guys do in response because you're not getting the vibration out of it? It's harder. You blow harder. And then what happens when it doesn't work? What do you do then? Blow harder. You, you, you squeeze. <laughs> this is why I explained it like a Chinese finger trap, right? Because that's, that's the perfect example. Okay, I gotta pull harder so I can get out. And then, and then get it right. And this is what happens. So you say, if that's your vocal folds, why are you guys tightening up? And you go hot. And they all go. So I'll say, you're literally just dampening that vibration. And then you're gonna blow more air, which is gonna cause more pressure. And it's not gonna work. And then you're gonna tighten up more. And it turns into that Chinese finger trap, right? So what I usually do at this point is for an exercise, I'll get a, a note on a little, I'll just pick one out of thin air. Ma. Now say, let's just do an octave, but I just want us to slide. Uh, and let's just slide that octave. Uh, uh, so I'll tell the guys, don't. So once again, it's like the don't think of a purple elephant thing. So don't say, don't tense up. Whatever you do, don't think of a purple elephant. Please, right? So I'll say, keep it the same as you go up. Don't change anything here on that. Ma. Ma. So let's get a little, little bit of a longer drag. Ma. Great stuff. Now let's get. Ma. say at this point, don't think about just keeping it the same. Think about relaxing as you go up. Make yourself actually relax as you go up. Ma, ma. Great. So what I want you to do, and you'll probably have some people struggling, so I'll say, I want you to physically tense up for the first note, and by the time you get to the last one, I want you to be completely relaxed. Be a little lazy with it. Ma, so tense up. Ma. Just to get them used to the sensation of relaxing into it. So I'll do a couple exercises like that, mess around with that. So obviously for a demo song, you want to emphasize once again the same stuff. You want to talk about that good, you know, good alignment. But then ma, let's get some. I want to take that same thing apply to somewhere. What I'll usually do is make them slide it to start the song just as a demo first time. So let's do that. Some, somewhere over the rainbow. So I'll tell you, keep it in that same light place. Don't, once you get up there, you say, okay, I'm in the high range. And i got to tighten up to stay there. Tell them apply the same things. Some, somewhere. 
ki tere çam See, what, what note do you guys think we're on here? So we, we give that to an F. What I usually do, or no, we were higher on that one. So, so. so what I usually do is I crank it up somewhere to like a, a G or an A flat. I just keep playing with it. So, but they don't know any difference. So I go, let's get that song. Let's get a nice light slide. Right, and I, I actually I've done it where I even crank it up to an A or B. That was an A flat. So how many guys, if they could get even their chorus just getting late singing an A flat, oh, you'd be over the moon, right? Oh, you mean my chorus Westminster? <coughs> uh, just think about that. Just get them up to an A flat, and I'll work them, and then they don't even know any better. So I get them completely relaxed, and now I'm working them without even knowing any better about singing, there you get basses, you get everyone just singing A flats. And are there people that are gonna go in falsetto? Yeah, I hope so. But you know, I think otherwise, you know, they're all freaks. But you want to just work them and I'll work them A flat, A, and work them with complete easiness. And I say, hey, what's the highest note in the song? If it's like banana boat song, the lead's the highest note is uh, F. I'll be like, look how look how far below you guys just did. And I'll be like, so you guys shouldn't even think about straight in the song. And then you tie it back to the song. Any qu oh yeah, question. Do you mention the falsetto at all? Um, I usually do that in a potluck thing. I just tell them, just let your voice go. I don't even want them to think about it, because then you're going to get the guy who comes in, probably baritone once again. So you mean to tell me an F, I do this, the register. Oh, and this, and then, okay, hold on, let me put the car in here. You know, you don't want that, right? You want to just say, just let your voice go. Just trust it, think about that, because the whole thing is getting them to just let it go. Because if they, if they're, Think about it. When you first come into singing, once again, we talked about ego, we talked about how it's sensitive. It's all about letting them trust. Just trust me. Just let it go. Just let it go. And that's a, a great lesson, and that's something that I think you guys can apply to your choruses, but um, it, it just works. It gets them trusting and gets them loosening up. Any questions about that lesson or any lesson so far? Or you could have a seat for lessons, the, the rest, I'll just talk through it. What? What was the end of 30 minutes? Yeah. Lessons you're talking about. Have the first session, let's say you have that done, then you have the sectionals. Yeah. And that's where you actually learn the song. Yes. So you have that section leader that can help out too. Yeah, time. I mean, best you can. I mean, when I started, week, I had nine guys. I mean, right. But they, then the next week, you go back to a lesson time. Yep. Not singing the song. No. And then back to sectionals. Yep. The song. Okay. Yep. That's the whole point. It's getting them to learn it in three different ways. Yeah. And the demo songs and exercises you're doing it in the sectional as a section and then trying to apply it on the course with everyone else. Cool. Um, so week four, uh, I've been here for close to 50 years, I think it was like 47 years. Uh, I'm originally a classical trombonist, so you know, when it comes to breathing and you know, we, we, uh, we pipe a little bit of air through that you know, big thing. So breathing's a big topic for brass players. So Arnold Jacob was the principal tubist of the Chicago Symphony for close to 50 years. Early in his career, he had an accident and half one of his lungs collapsed. So here he is, a tuba player, Chicago Symphony, with one lung. So he said, how the heck am I going to pull this off? He was on the faculty at Northwestern and he actually got it so they let him diagnose or uh, work on cadavers so he could understand anatomy and understand what's going on. So this guy goes in, learns, he works on these cadavers and he figures out a couple things about breathing. And what he began to understand was the biggest issues with breathing is that we expand to breathe versus breathing to expand. So how many times have you ever seen a guy in the chapter, and this is something you're going to emphasize with the guys, how many times have you ever seen someone, okay, take a big breath. <gasps> yeah. Big breath, right? <sighs> Not much. He realized if we sit there, we actually try and work against our body or direct where the air is going, we're going to do a worse job because then our body naturally knows where to breathe the most. I know this is controversial when you get guys talking about diaphragmatic breathing. There are some breathing control things that I, I believe in and, and focus, but for the sake of newbies, you don't want them thinking about, okay, I gotta 
you know, puff up, I gotta do that, because what they're actually doing is they're creating tension and they're, you know, they're not using their breath in the most efficient way possible. So what I thought with Arnold Jacobs is realize that he had another 40 years in his career. All those ridiculous Chicago 70 brass recordings you hear about, uh, you know, the, where you hear that ridiculous tuba in the background, all those great recordings, the guy had one lung. So if he could play tuba for the Chicago 70 with one, one lung for 40 years, pretty sure you can make it to the end of a phrase, and, uh, you know, <laughs> singing leap. You know, and, and you, you get a couple laughs out of that, but it's true. It's like, I'm pretty sure you can make it to the end, and you can make it through this song. You know, I think you're okay if he was able to pull it off. So, um, what I usually do is I, I just get that breathing, and we do some exercise. Stand up where you are. All right, so what I'll usually do is I'll have them, you know, I'll say, okay, I want you to take a breath. I want you to do it where you, you know, you puff everything up and, you know, you, you take the, you try and force the breath into your chest like that. All right, so let's do that again and then tell me how much air you get on the way out, so. All right, how many people feel tension when you sucked it in? Yeah. Okay, great. How many people think there was a lot of air there? You're going to get some people say, oh, I got a good amount of air. Okay. So now what I want you to do is the other thing he said is you just, you just focus on the sensation of the air. Don't even think about the air and guiding it through. Just focus on the cool sensation of the air coming into your mouth. So we're going to breathe in for a count of four. I want you to just focus on that sensation, the coolness of the air in your mouth. So I'll give you a four to start and then you'll breathe in for four. One, two, three, four. I think people feel like they got more air in that way. Yeah. All right. So now what I want you to do is really focus on making the air even cooler in your mouth. So how do you, how are you actually going to make the air cooler? You're going to suck it in faster. Don't focus on where it's going. Just focus on making the air even cooler going in. So I'll give you four to start, and then you'll breathe in for four. So one, two, ready, go. How many people feel like you had even more air that time? Great. So I'll say, how many people were actually guiding where the air went? No? And you had all that air? How many people think that's more air than when you sing? Okay. So now I'll say, well, we're going to make it faster. I'll give you one, two, three. But I want you to suck the air and just pull it. Do it without tension. Suck the air and just pull it and focus on just making it as cool as you can as quickly as possible. So one, two, three. So I'll keep it a rhythm. One, two, three. I even feel like they had a nice amount of air that time. I'll, now I'll give you half a beat. So I'll give you one, two, three, four. <gasps> one, two, three, four. <sighs> How's that? Okay, this time do it without lifting your shoulders. To keeping your body, get into that perfect alignment. If you have to do this, you know, I'd probably go through it with the guys. One, two, three, four. <sighs> Don't lift your shoulders, try it again. Lift your shoulders the last one quick. One, two, three, four. You, so some people said, oh, I felt it come here. You didn't guide it to go there. You didn't try and displace your intestines. You didn't, it naturally happened, right? How many people feel like that's a pretty good breath of air? Yeah. Mm How -hmm. people feel like if you get that breath of air when you're singing, you'd be pretty good? Yeah. And I'll usually walk them through, if they want some exercises on, I'll usually teach them some breath, breath exercises for just generally getting more air. But what we'll do is we'll usually apply it to another song. So what would be another one, like Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star? Let's do that. So I'd say, let's get two whole breaths, and then we'll do Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. So twink. So I'll give you one, two. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. Great, so we'll do that again. We'll get two full beats. And I want to see how far we can get. When you run out of the air, just stop saying. Twi one, two. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are up above the world so high, like a diamond in the sky. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. <laughs> hey, give a round of applause. Okay, at the end. There we go. Maybe close enough. So what I'll do that, and then I'll say, okay, let's try it with one breath. 
and then you start working them down. So then, guess what? They have to try and squeeze X amount in, try and get to see how they can do with half a breath, so that they're teaching themselves how to be more efficient, right? Because if you got give a guy, hey, take you got 12 beats, the guy's not going to take a 12 beat breath. He's going to wait till the end anyway. You know, it's like. It doesn't matter if you have, it's like I've played a lot of trombone for, you know, operettas and stuff. You sit there, oh, what's this? Oh, 368 measures of rest. Okay, was there a wah-wah around here? And then you walk <laughs> off and then you come back. But it's all about how focused you can make it. Try and get, shrink the amount of time they can take for the breath. Start long so they get the natural feeling. But then as they get faster, they're going to tense up, right? But you want to teach them how to dial that back. Okay, well, let's dial that back. And then dial back the tension, increase the speed, stuff like that. That's how I teach breathing. If they ask me, oh, belly breathe this, I, I, I'll usually walk them through. I'll say, okay, here's the different approaches that a lot of people use. Maybe something else works better for you. Then I'll talk about a little bit of the belly breathing or, oh, here, you know, try and push the chair back. I'll go through those because maybe this doesn't necessarily work for someone. We're all built a little differently. I'll usually walk them through, you know, a couple of different styles of breathing and see what they say. Cool? Mm -hmm. Any questions? Have a seat. So we're pretty much at the end here. Um, we're good. Uh, great. So um, for weeks five and six, they're kind of potluck. Um, what I like to do for weeks, I've done different things each time. This is once again going to knowing your audience, catering to them. Um, like uh, I've done a couple times where uh, you know I'll talk about harmony, and I'll bring in a quartet from the chapter and then we'll demonstrate some stuff, right? And then I'll get them, you know, we'll do like a, a tag or something, and I'll get them trying to, to do the harmony. Well, sometimes I'll just do it with the group, and I'll start talking about harmony. I'll talk about, you know, vowels, and how, hey, you want to try and sing the same word together. Uh, so I've done that with a quartet. I've done it another time where I brought the chorus into demo. So this was a later one, but I used the banana boat song. And I was like, Deo! And I was like, all right, now I want you when we get to the O in Deo, me say Deo! So I was like, pick any value you want. And then the guys hear it, and then I say, okay, I want half of you guys to do it, a day ah, Deo, you know, I go that. And then they hear that, I'll say, now I want everybody to do Deo, and then everybody heard it. Right? Once again, building up that trust. So I brought the chorus in for like a master class to show vowels. I brought it in where I've had the quartet come in and we demonstrate some stuff about harmony. Yeah. You know, I'll walk them through, I'll do some cascades, like where we all start on. Like, you know, the normal, and then the barriers go down to the fifth, bass go down to the bottom, tenors go two, three. You know, I'll do stuff like that with just the group. It's very challenging because a lot of them are still super leaners. So sometimes that doesn't work, depending on the crew. But well, you're just trying to get them to have their own realization. Even when I had the quartet of the course, I didn't have them in there for the whole time. I wanted the guys to have their own epiphanies on their own, right? I was just using that as an illustrative tool to help teach. Um, so I'll do that a lot of time. Uh, then, you know, even one time I had a guy that came in, and this is where I say, use your best judgment and try and tailor it to the crew you have. I had a guy come in, and he's like, you know, you know, I, this is cool, but I really just want to learn how to sing for rock music. Are you going to teach me how to sing for rock music? I'm in a band. And I was like, yeah, I'll teach you how to sing for rock music. So I was like, you know, let's do something a little different for this. And this was actually one of our earlier ones. So I took, you know, uh, Sting and the Police, I took the song Roxanne. You know, the part where they do Roxanne, 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 where they're doing the chords. And the leads go, turn on the red light, right? So I did that and I actually wrote it out like a tag. And we sang it along with the CD. So I had all the people singing it with the CD once, and then where we did it alone, where it was just people go, Roxanne, Roxanne, Roxanne. And then the leads would come in and do that. And they sang it like the police. This guy got so jazzed. Okay, he's starting This is sick. This is awesome. Oh, man. Guys, and he's been with the chapter ever since it comes to everything. <laughs> he sings, sings lead. I mean, like Oli will tell you, the guy's so, like, he's so pumped up. He gets, he's so excited. He's like, this is awesome. You know, but like that hooked him. You know, because just because I did something different, you know, he was like, he thought it was just going to be, you know, some of the guys came in, he heard him singing Just Barbershop. He's like, oh, that's okay, but, you know, I really just want to sing and have fun and do my own thing. What do you think will give them the most out of your class? Like, do what you think is best for them. You said that typically when you voice test them, you'll split them into either leads or basses. Generally, yeah. So how do you do harmony stuff and tags and stuff in your class if you only have... Because uh, generally what I'll do is I'll take 
I'll, I'll leave them might be an okay bar you know, and I'll, I'll just split it off you know like because if I'm just doing like tags and stuff I'll just right. hey can you sing this part I don't even tell them it's Barry okay. hey you sing this part you sing yeah. this part that's the other thing this is the truth about us as barbershoppers we've gotten to the point where it's very well I'm a lead yeah I'm a bit you know it's no you, you're a vocalist like and I know it's hard because well I've learned all 12 podcasts I can never go back you know no it's that, that's not the case you know and we've got to realize how it's a lot more porous than we think it is and uh, granted, I still have that struggle very much with my chapter because once they're there, you know, it's like they already got it etched on their muzzle and, you know, they're, oh, okay, Joe, baritone, and then, you know, they're there forever. But uh, for a class, I just, I mess with it, make it very porous. Any other questions about how to do this? For a class. A anything? Before we call the marketing guy, oh, did you have a Yeah, I'm, I'm picked up on one thing. Uh, I believe in very much. There has been not one <coughs> of how to be negative. Everything you do is always on the positive. Is yeah. making sure that the guy, you know, good job, telling him what he does. No matter what he sounded like, he's always done a good job. Yeah. And and whenever you do your singing lessons, it's obvious that you only do positive. So I, I, I believe, uh, I'll tell you the truth, one of the best things that I ever learned from directors was when you yell at the chorus or you say something negative, it's not for them, it's for you, right? It's, it's like the, the stupidest band-aid thing you can do because you sit there, your guys are trying, right? If they're there, they're trying. They, they want to do well by you. They want to sing well. Nobody comes saying, you know, I hope I really suck tonight. No, no one says that, right? They want to do good. Yeah, right. Uh, with Dom, maybe you won't look at that. No. But so you come and you say that, and then the guys do it poorly, and you start, you start, oh, come on, guys, I want you. You know, you start ripping into them. Guess what you do? You're you're giving yourself like a quick little relief, but now you just knock that guy down, and then it's that shiny finger trap thing again. So you get that relief, which you're instantly gonna feel crappy about, like pretty much a minute later. And it's only because you're not good enough as a leader to control yourself at that point. That's why you lash out. Now, yeah, and this is bold, this is true. It's because you're not good enough as a leader to have the self-management skills that you can keep yourself under control and keep it focused. So if you're going and you're lashing, oh, you guys, blah, blah, that's your fault. And if they're not saying well enough, that's your fault too, because you're the freaking director. And if you don't, mo oh, they don't learn their music? Here's the other thing that's true talk while well, we just have directors and musical leadership. Oh, my guys are, are lazy, they'll learn the music. Be a better director. Do you inspire them? Did you pick a song that they actually want to learn? I have a rule in my course, we have six weeks to learn music. If they don't learn it in six weeks, I say, we throw it out. Oh, what? Because if they liked it enough, they learn it in six weeks. I did a shitty job as a director picking the music if they don't like it enough that they want to learn it in six weeks. Because if they like it enough, they're going to be singing it in the car. They can't get it out of their head. They're going to want to sing it for their wife. Hey, honey, how beautiful is this baritone part? And she says, get the hell out of here. <laughs> and, and, and that's what's going to be. You want to pick a song that they love. You want to pick music that they love. You want to give them such an inspiring rehearsal that as they're driving home on Tuesday night, they say, I can't wait for next Tuesday. That even though they sang for two and a half hours, they want more. And if we don't, that's our fault. And if your chorus sucks, that's probably your fault too. It's your fault. I mean, if you say, oh, I'm down to nine guys, well, then try, do this. Get the program going. I, I, I've been there, but I'm telling you, it's on you. And the this, this second you start pushing it off on everyone else, well, if I got a decent board, I mean, half of my board was embalmed when I started. I mean, they were just dead. They couldn't do anything. They were useless. I came to them with this. They're like, oh, it sounds like a lot of work. You know, you're just sitting there like, you know, I'm trying to save you guys. I'm trying to do that. You know, I, I'll tell you the truth. It was on me. And then, uh, you know, you talk to directors. Well, you can't do anything administrative or, or like that. You just have to let the board. No. You have to. It's your job as the leader to help your chapter succeed. And if your board's sucking and they're screwing up, jump in. Cut them off. Kick them off. Say, hey, get the other guy. Say, do you want this chapter to survive? This guy is a... a is, is not the guy in the musical leadership. Right? He, he would have been great 60 years ago. But we need someone who's a little more dynamic. We need and do that. And that's the other thing. This is the hard truth about it. You need to get, it's your job to get all that stuff working on you. 
oh, well, I'm just the director, I'm an employee, of the no, forget about it. That, that's an old BHS baloney excuse, right? Or a SPEP squad baloney excuse, but better yet, oh, well, the, you know, I'm just an employee of the chorus, I don't, no, you're the leader. And if you have a dynamic where you're, you're you know, hamstrung by the, the board and that, find, find a new chapter, but seriously, it's your job to, the chapter at the end of the day, it rises and falls on you. You know, uh, Doug Brown said something brilliant to me once. He said, you know, think about the conductor. He said, the conductor of an orchestra never makes a sound on a record, but his name's right there, Eugene Ormandy, the Philadelphia Orchestra. Why is that? But guess what, if that was a crappy, crappy recording, do you think they'd say it must be because that second violin? No, they say Eugene Ormandy's a crappy director, which they wouldn't say, even though he was a lunatic. But that, that's for another story. He was, he was hilarious. Um, I always love the story about he would pull people aside after a concert and always he would, he would give the same like lecture every night to a member. You single-handedly ruin my orchestra's performance. Yeah, his orchestra, 120 people, but uh, he, he was a little ticked. Point being, it's your job as the director to make sure everything goes well. And if you, the more you pawn off on other people, the less you can control. And especially if your chapter's hurting right now, do the right thing. Don't say, well, I, I can't be the one to do that. I'm the director. Jump in, you know. Clean the floors and windows. Do what you have to. You know, push your ego aside and say, what do I have to do to help this chapter? And do it. And I say push your ego aside because you have an ego or else you wouldn't be a director. Okay? Push it aside and do what you say. <coughs> Any questions before everybody comes back in? We have the joint session. Cool. Have a bathroom break. Thank you. Thank you.